Welcome to the road to growth, success of an entrepreneur. We've raised the bar. Learn firsthand from successful business owners and create your own path to success. I'm going to show you how great I am. It's time to hit the road to growth with team lead of the Enriquez Group, Realtor Vinny. Hi, Road to Growth listeners. Today I have Steven Summers. Don't get fooled by the PH. It is Steven. Just wanted to throw that out there right now. <laughs> CEO and founder of Marketplace Superheroes. Thank you, Stephen, for being here. Vinny, it's absolutely great to be here. Thank you for having me. I am really looking forward to the conversation. No, I mean, my, my pleasure. I mean, uh, I mean, online sales is, is huge these days, especially with everything going, uh, for the most part, digital. Uh, you're based out of Ireland. I mean, in the U.S. right now, we're... We opened, well, we closed, we opened up, we closed for the most part. How is it over there in Ireland? Yeah, it's uh, actually getting better, finally. it's uh, So here where I am in Wexford, Ireland, which is on the southeast coast of Ireland, a lot of the restaurants and all are back open again. Everything's kind of available. You just have to wear like a mask going in there, but certainly life is a lot better than it was even a month ago when we had a lot of stuff closed. So uh, yeah, look, and, and in the States too, I mean, Depends where you live, right? Because yeah. every different state is going at it a different way. So it seems like we're getting to a better place anyway. It looks that way. Well, and if you're listening to this on the podcast, we do do this live uh, through Twitch, YouTube, uh, LinkedIn, all those different platforms. So if you're listening on the podcast, it's probably a couple of months down the road. So things could be totally different by the time. We could have a, another one going on, something else. But whatever it is, digital is, is here and not going anywhere. Yeah. Uh, so, Stephen, if someone were to ask you, what's your what's your elevator pitch? How would you describe yourself? Yeah, so Marketplace Superheroes is a company that teaches people how to sell their own branded products all across the world on Amazon, even if they've never done it before and they're a complete beginner. That's basically what that company does. But we do a lot of other things that that we've we've built as well, many other businesses off the back of that, like a freight company, a software company, and all of that. So, you know, um, so yeah, that's the, that's the elevator pitch. And from there it can go as in depth as anybody wants, you know, I mean, I, I think for your audience as well, it would be helpful maybe to just talk about maybe how, how we've grown the different businesses we've been involved in. I'm, I'm going to try and make it as, uh, you know, as useful to everybody today as we possibly can. No, no, definitely. I mean, and we'll get there. And I, I definitely want to hear your journey. I mean, were you... Sure into technology as a youngster i mean who was a young steven yeah well young steven was a little bit different than steven now i'm 34 now just for context for everybody but when i was in my teens you know i actually was trying to make it in the music industry that's oh. that was what i wanted to do i wanted to be a rock star right but uh you know you might have guessed that didn't work out that's all right I'm, I'm i'm over it now but yeah i was playing a lot of music and i was performing all over ireland here and that was my dream and so uh, a business was very much in the background, although I was hustling, doing my own gigs since I was like 11 years old or something like that. You know, I started my first ever gig that I ever did. Now, I didn't organize that when I played at that one. But by the time I was 12, 13, we were organizing our own concerts as our band, you know, traveling around the country. So definitely I had that bit of entrepreneur spirit there. Uh, but the, there's a big difference between having like an entrepreneur spirit and then having a business that pays you enough money you don't have to do something else, which is a huge shift that a lot of people have to make, myself included. So I was doing that right up until I was in my uh, early 20s. And ba what happened was I left home to go and play music in Dublin, which is the capital of Ireland. But I actually had done two years studying business in college. And I actually got student of the year in my second year, which was pretty cool. I never finished college. I actually did do three years of study. My third year I did at nighttime did night school while I was working in a job during the day to like pay me enough money so I could play music. Um, and I studied marketing and I really fell in love during that time with business theory. Uh, how do these things like all these books in the background for those of you watching, like it all came, it all started then where I started reading all these different business books and whatever had no practical use for any of it. Cause I was like, I want to play music, but Hey, I'll just keep reading this stuff and see where it takes me. So, you know, long story short, in my early 20s, the band broke up and I had to make a big change, which I, I can keep going if you like, or we can talk about that period. But yeah, yeah, no, 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 just you know, well, I want to jump in. I mean, 
I mean, let's rewind a little bit. I mean, to a musician, you said it was 11 or is it 13? Uh, when I was 11, I started playing my first ever gigs uh, and okay. they were in bars here in Ireland. And I can tell you that this, there was no anti-smoking law at the time. So okay. like I would sing one song and I was only 11 and I literally, I was choking singing the next song. <laughs> Were your bandmates or was you had bandmates? You said right. I, when I started out, I was on my own, and then when I was about, I think twelve, almost thirteen, I don't know, maybe yeah, twelve, thirteen, I started playing in a band. We were called Burnout, uh, which is a Burnout term. At 13, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Named after the Green Day song Burnout, of course, and their album Dookie. For those of you who are into music, and uh, yeah, we just we were having a lot of fun, and and, and I did that for many years, and. I kind of made the choice when I was maybe 15 or so that that's what I wanted to do because I was choosing between playing soccer actually or playing music at the time because from the time I was about 10 or 11, yeah, maybe not even earlier, maybe eight, actually eight or nine, right up until I was 14, I played soccer at a very high level. I was like captain of my county in Ireland and also I was heading towards being a professional, but yeah, I chose music. Um, I, I probably should have chosen soccer now. When I look back at it. <laughs> oh man, they make some some money right there. Sure, uh, sure. Now, okay, were your bandmates older than you then? Around the same age, a little bit older, but but in around the same age, and yeah, we were all. It was so you know, bandmate. The band thing is interesting because it's kind of like been in a business now. Yeah. In that, like, it's difficult to find people who are as dedicated as you are, right? And so, my current business partner, who has been for. 12 years now, Robert Ricky, like he's brilliant because he's as dedicated and as crazy as I am. But yeah, the band was tough because you were always trying to convince at least one guy to come on, you know, buy an amplifier. So you actually have something we can play with. It was a lot of that going on, but it was, it was very fun. And then who was, who was getting your gigs? We did. We booked ourselves. Yeah. We would were you uh, calling around, yeah. knocking on doors. What were you doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we were calling around, knocking on doors around different small record labels around the country, as well as that we used to arrange a lot of our own gigs, like I mentioned. So we would hire like a hall and then we would promote the gig. There was no social media at that time. I'm, I'm getting to be the stage where I'm that old, even though, you know, I'm not that old. But uh, yeah, there was no social media. So it was all going around town, sticking up posters, telling people that it was going to be on, standing in the street, handing out flyers. All that kind of uh, guerrilla marketing. What did your parents do before this? When you're when you were young, what did your parents do? So my parents, they uh, both really. My dad, when I was growing up, was uh, worked in factories, and that really taught me a big lesson of like, you know, I didn't want to work a night shift for the rest of my life. Um, my dad worked a night shift in a, in a factory in Wexford uh, for many many years, different factories, and he'd be in and out of work, you know, because factories were manufacturing is a difficult difficult industry to be in. You'd you lose your job and then another place would open. You'd be in there. And then my mom, for a lot of my childhood, was a stay-at-home mother, looked after myself and my uh, siblings. I have uh, I have, two, well, I have two siblings. One passed away, unfortunately. I had a brother who was a little bit older than me, passed away. But I have a sister, Lisa, and she actually works with me now in the business, which is, which is pretty cool. But uh, anyway, yeah, my mom now, she works part-time. And my dad now works part-time, um, which is great. And I help actually... I have, they're like they would do a bit of work well, a bit of work quote unquote with me as well and we pay them something as well you know so i try my best to take care of of the family as much as i can um but yeah they still work part-time themselves and they were not entrepreneurs uh wonderful people were great parents but you know they didn't want to play music they had no interest in music they thought i was out of my mind uh when i was playing music and wanted to do it as a career you know my, my parents wanted me to get a stable job uh finished college and all of that, which is why I did business for two years. It was a little bit of a, hey, I'll do business because I didn't actually leave home. I, I actually was able to still live at home and, and go to this college because I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I was like, I don't want to waste my parents' money because they don't have it to waste. So instead of me just going off and studying something I don't want to do, I'll stay here and study business. And luckily for me, I fell in love with it during that time. Where do you think the passion of handing out the flyers, booking the gigs, being up on stage was it was it the the thrill of being up there was it the thrill of making money was it the name recognition i mean what was what yeah. was the, the the passion what was that why 
definitely a mixture of a lot of those things you know i have to say it was pretty exciting because you know for for young kids we we used to have like a big wad of money we after the gig and of course you're paying out everybody and that was kind of a, a thrilling thing and even when i was younger like i've always done hustle gigs you know from the time i was maybe like eight eight or nine i was out walking around the people's houses and trying to cut their grass or whatever so the the band was an extension of a lot of that kind of hustle stuff and uh and yeah so that was one definitely you know having people cheering you on and telling you you're wonderful is of course a motivation when you're a kid and when you're a guy you know let's be a little bit uh whatever here but you know it was about going after women as well right you play in a band you you thought you were cool and you were hoping some girl thought you were cool so that was definitely a motivating factor but certainly as it went on it was more about i really enjoyed writing songs i used to write a lot of the stuff with another guy and it was uh it, that that's where i got a lot of the enjoyment you you wrote something you recorded it and you you played it uh and it was great but i looking back vinnie i wasn't good enough to make it like you know mm. i wasn't good enough but but i thought i but i thought i was and and i wasn't and but the interesting thing was I a band I loved and still do a band called Stereophonics. They're a UK band from Wales. So I followed them my whole life. And when my brother passed away, he was 11. I was 11. Sorry. He was 13. Excuse me. Um, so, so the, so I started playing gigs like not long after he had passed away really. And I threw myself into playing these, this band Stereophonics. I would play all of their songs, learned all of them. It was a way, it was like a coping mechanism for me at that mm. time. And uh, and long story short, when I was in my early 20s, I ended up playing on the same stage as the Stereophonics, not in the band now, but in, in the same stage. It was another event. I got to meet the, the guys in the Stereophonics. And I knew at that point when I met them, I actually was only really playing music to, to like meet these guys because I, I, I it was a big part of how I coped with my brother's loss as a child. And so that was a big moment. It's like, holy crap, like I actually don't really want to play music. I've kind of achieved what I set it to achieve now. Now I can move on. Now what will I do, you know? Now, for, from here, you, you mean going to school, studying, but then you also get a job, a government job that's, yeah. that's paying you. I mean, I'm guessing, I know government jobs here in the U.S. I mean, maybe they won't pay you that much, but it's steady no. pay. It's good retirement, I mean, benefits, yeah. things like that. Was it is it like that over there in Ireland or how is it set yeah. up? Yeah, like the pay now, the job I was in, the pay was very poor because I was just a data processor. Mm -hmm. So I was at the lowest, like the lowest rung. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. like I was really badly paid. But but you know, the job you couldn't pay much more for the job because I mean it was because their system was inefficient. Like I would get there was faxes would come in. Uh, for when somebody was uh, detained in like a mental health institution and these forms would come in and I had to take those forms and type the information into a computer. Like it was very inefficient, right? But that's how it was back then. And so it wasn't a good job. It wouldn't pay well, but it paid me enough money to survive. And I mean survive living in Dublin, playing music. And that's all it was designed to be ever. Uh, but when the band stopped being a thing, I ended up having to go full time in that position and I didn't last there too long. I actually must chronicle back and see how long I was there after the band finished. Maybe it was a year and a half, maybe not even as much as that. Uh, Cause I really wanted out. I mean, I was only in my early twenties now, but at the same time, I still felt that pain of like, I'm not living up to where I want to be. And I'm losing my brother at that stage of my life. Also gave me that feeling of like, I want to do something with my life. I don't want to just sit here in this job bored out of my skull all day and i didn't want to finish college either because i just felt like every class was all about well when you're working in a job like here's what you're gonna do and there's nothing wrong with working in a job of course not but i didn't want to i wanted to have my own thing i wanted to have my and i think the band was the same the business has been the same i wanted to make money of my own and that was a big motivating factor i, I had someone else previously the 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 podcast and i i don't know if it was uk or ireland but they said there was a almost like a, a negative connotation to entrepreneurship um yeah, and it right. was like something that she had to really push through to her family saying i'm doing this i'm doing this and you have to be kind of strong-minded to kind of go that route 100 you know uh 
in every country, there's an element of this. I mean, America is, is, is better because I do think entrepreneurship is celebrated a little more in America. Uh, but there's still like a whole bunch of people in, in, in the States, just like in Ireland, who will try to drag you down, right? It doesn't matter what country you're in. But certainly here in, the, in Ireland and in the UK as well, we do have a culture of like, well, that person's probably an idiot because they're making money. Like that is a big thing here. And it comes from the fa- it comes from our history, really, in our culture. You know, I mean, Ireland was a very poor country for a long time. Uh, we've come a long way over the years, but certainly that was historically the situation. People living through the world wars, stuff like that. So all of that uh, hangover <clears throat> really still remains. And so, yeah, I mean, everyone told me when I worked in the job, you're going to be back here in six months, so don't quit, whatever you do. And I was like, well, I'm quitting because they won't give me any time off. So I'm going. Oh, well, they're like, you're going to make a huge mistake. It wasn't a mistake. It was the best decision I ever made. I suppose. Why is that? Well, at the end of the day, most people in this country aren't entrepreneurs. They've never been entrepreneurs. They have no interest in being an entrepreneur. So how could we expect the people around us then to have like a positive outlook on something they have no understanding about, you know, so it doesn't make anybody any less or anything like that if you aren't interested in it. But at the same time, it's a big problem. And I find this with our clients nowadays at Marketplace Superheroes. You know, we have 9,000 people who've gone through our program. And uh, yeah, every day people report that people are dragging them down, telling them they're not going to be successful. This is a problem that is is massive. And I would also say that there's a weird other side to it, which is when you make it and you are successful, it's kind of a thing of people asking you, how did you do it then a little bit? You know, it's like they didn't support you at all. But then when you made it, it's like, oh, well, you're successful now. So now we'll give you the time of day. We'll, you obviously have figured out something. But there's still people will think like, because I've made money now that I'm like uh, doing something illegal or something like that. Like that's literally a belief system that's out there. <laughs> I had a, um a artist on here before. And he just he does really well for himself. He's in for some some celebrities and things like that. But um, some clothing line. But he says where he's from back east in the United States, when he goes there, people try to pull him down. But when he's out of his element, he basically can be who he is because it, and the way he described it was the idea that those people see what they could have been. Yeah, you're basically what they could have been. And you basically um, can give yes. him that negative. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. that's okay. true. Yeah. What, what, um, so what drove you to give up this steady job? What drove you to basically say, I have, I have this, the future, this career here, but I want something else. I used to walk to work every day, really feeling very depressed. You know, I would feel like just wrenching pain in my stomach of just, I just don't want to go in here. And what added to that was fat, kind of rewinding a little bit when I was in the job a little while and the band just broke up and whatever, I just started getting really unhealthy for a while. I was eating like crappy food, drinking a lot of alcohol. I mean, I would drink two bottles of wine a lot of nights in the house. And the house I was living in was awful. I mean, I was living with 10 other people in a big house. It wasn't like, you know, it was was really awful. And they all worked night shifts. I didn't. So they'd be partying late at night. And I'm just like (laughs) trying to sleep and working this job I don't like and all these kind of things holding you back and you just feel awful. Uh, What turned it around for me, though, initially was I started listening to personal development stuff. So Mm. Success Principles by Jack Canfield is my favorite book still. I owe massive uh, debt of gratitude to him and the work he, he did. And what I started doing is I started finding he had this thing called Ask Jack Live. So it was uh, recordings of that. I just got all these recordings, like hours and hours and hours of, of stuff. Him, Brian Tracy, Tony Robbins, uh, on and on and on, all these speakers, Napoleon Hill, etc. And I would just listen to them every single day, walking to work during lunch break, walking home again. And that was a good turning point because I started to take a lot more steps in the right direction. I started to get healthier. Uh, I moved out of that house. I moved in with a friend in a place that was nicer, but still wasn't that nice, but it was nicer. I just didn't have very much money left over because the rent was very high because we were just two of us living in a property. Dublin's very expensive uh, in mm. place to live in Ireland, you know. And when you're making like, you know, 1800 you know, dollars, let's just say, a, a month, it's it's very difficult. 
So, so there was a lot of that going on. The thing I wish I had have found sooner in life was learning practical skills because I was learning, this is all this positive information. And that's the thing that gave me the courage to go, I don't want to do this job forever. I want to do something with my life. What can I do? Initially, I thought maybe I'll go and talk about, you know, like being successful or personal development. And then I thought, but <laughs> I'm not successful. I, I work in a job I hate. So how can I start? And people do this all the time, as I'm sure you know, right? Like people literally will be a success coach and they've, they've made no money and they're not successful, right? Like it happens all the time. Uh, but I didn't feel right about that. I was like, I can't do that. And I did really go after that. I was really wanting to go down that line. Like I was trying to arrange classes locally and just start teaching the principles and not put myself out there as some kind of guru, but just be like, look, I, these are really helping me. Let me share them, mm -hmm. uh, which I, I could have done a lot more of. I just didn't have that framework of belief at the time. So long story short, I, it gave me enough information to, to, to say, right, what do you want to do? And so I was business was what I wanted to do. Right. What's a line of business you can go down that makes sense? And I tried a lot of different things. I affiliate marketing and drop shipping and all these different bits and bobs. But for me, the thing that made a lot of sense at the time was just selling stuff on Amazon and eBay and places like that. But I had no idea how to do it. So I, I, I learned the idea of success leaves clues. It's a Tony Robbins idea, right? Mm. So I'm like, okay, what can I do? And then it was, who can I get help from? So I started telling everybody I knew, I want to learn how to sell products on the internet. I want to learn how to sell products on the internet. Mm -hmm. And luckily for me, this got back to my aunt who lived in Northern Ireland, which was about two and a half hours north of where I was living at the time. And she called me and she's like, and I didn't speak to her too often. She said, listen, I hear you're looking to sell products on the internet. Yes. So she said, I've got this friend, Robert. That's what he does. Do you want to meet him? And I was just like, absolutely. So all of a sudden, all these things, like uh, it's up there, success principles. I was literally only reading earlier on today. All these things I was reading about, you know, deciding what you want, uh, the success leaves clues stuff, taking responsibility, right? All of these principles were sort of coming together now. And I was like, wow, it actually worked. I'm going to speak to a guy who's doing it successfully. Amazing. And so, yeah, she arranged for me to, to meet Robert. And obviously, we can go into all that next, but. I know I've been talking for a while, so I'll be quiet for a no, second. No, no, no. I mean, no, it's, it's, it's great. I mean, the idea of spreading out your message to everyone and having kind of like your your kind of razz open of what you're looking for, because you already had the, the idea of what you want to do, and now it's trying to find basically that individual that can help you get there. Yeah. Now, how did, how did that conversation go? I mean, did, did you drive up there? Did you make a phone call? I mean, did, yeah. what, what happened next? It was a very Irish uh, situation. So there was actually a comedian playing in Dublin and it just worked in my favor. She's like, there's this gig on uh, uh, Ed Byrne, a, a, a pretty successful mm -hmm. Irish comedian. Uh, he's going to be in town in, in Dublin where I was living. So she said, we're going to come down for the gig. Do you want to go? And then you can meet Rob, Robert and chat. And I was like, oh, yeah, this is great. And I was very fortunate. She was very good to me at uh, this aunt. Uh, she actually works for in the company now with us. She just does a little part time gig. My aunt, my auntie. What, what what was her connection to him? It was just a friend. I mean, friend. Was it... yeah, just a good friend, just one of her best friends. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Right. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're just a really good friend, and and they hung out. Um. So so they were older than me. You know, my aunt. Mm -hmm. They're all in their kind of. You know, Robert would have been in his actual mid thirties at the time. She mm -hmm. would have been older again. Uh. So so long story short, we get to meet at this gig. We see the gig. We drink a lot of beer, like Irish people do, although I don't drink alcohol anymore. Uh, but we did at the time. Uh, we had a whole bunch of beers. And then after the gig, we went to another bar. And it was there that I just started unloading questions at Robert. You know, I was right. asking him everything. Because I was learning all this stuff, reading up. So a lot of theory, but very little practical skill, which was right. a problem for me. Problem for anybody, by the way, if you don't have practical skill, you need that experience and practical skill. So I just started asking him a bunch of questions about drop shipping and selling branded products and wholesaling and everything I could I could think of. And so he answered very graciously and was very helpful to me. And he just said after a while, he said, look, the easiest thing is going to be if you want to come up to Northern Ireland for a week, spend some time in the warehouse, see what's going on, and then decide if it's something that you'd like to do. So I thought, 
unbelievable. Yes, I'll do it. So I took a week's vacation from work and uh, went up there, lived with my aunt in her spare room, the same aunt. Uh, she was very good to me and went to work every day in this warehouse for like a week. And it was cold. There were definitely a few rats running around and all the rest, but it was a amazing time because there was real products in this warehouse being sold to real people through eBay, through Amazon. And I was like, wow, this is actually a functioning business that I can learn from, which which was much better than all the theory and the fluff of the internet, you know, sure. like it means a lot better nowadays. But at the time I was reading so much crap, you know, from marketers rather than people who are actually doing the thing. And, uh, and yeah, I just fell in love with that week. And I just said, I got to do more of this. And that's when I quit my job, you know, because they wouldn't give me a career leave. So I thought I'll leave then. So I did. My aunt was again, really good to me. She said, live here for, you know, six months to nine months. And then, you know, if you can establish yourself, then you can uh, go to go somewhere else. And then, you know, I've done my, I've done my bit for you, you know, kind of thing. And, uh, and that's it. That's what I did. I, I quit the job and I went to work in the warehouse. I, uh, and I learned everything, how operations in the warehouse worked. I learned about how they, uh, source products, you know, from wholesalers and how they research products for private label selling products and everything you can imagine. And it was during that time for about nine months where Robert and I really started to bond and become like best friends as well as working together. And at the time he had two warehouses, lots of staff, and it was a very stressful situation simply because the business needed to change. It needed to move to new types of products. At the time it was all selling, you know, consumer electronics, accessories, products like speaker mounts and TV mounts and stuff like that. Cause that's the, it was the type of business that Robert was trying to run. Uh, but really we realized we could sell anything on, on Amazon and, and Amazon became our number one market because it was just so much bigger than eBay. It had so much more uh, growth potential. And of course that's, you know, over that year, we basically decided to go all in and start again, really. And that's that's what we did. It took us about 18 months to to do that whole process and get everything back around to a place where we didn't have a warehouse. Uh, we didn't have staff, but we had a business that was doing the best part of $2 million a year in revenue. And then that was selling our own branded products only. We stopped selling wholesale products and stuff like that just because we didn't have a warehouse anymore. Uh, and, but that was, they were, I look back at those days now and they were hard at the time, but they were, they were also great. Well, I know you, you two were becoming best friends in that, in that window in that, but in that 18 months, when did the transition or how did the transition come from employee to a uh, partner? Yeah, well, it kind of came just bit by bit. And I was really coming to a place where I was operating pretty much like a business partner over the months. Like I was, I was working 16 hour days with Robert every day, trying to fix problems, find new products. And I was making, like we were making very little money because we had to put all of our money back in again to restart the business. So that was, that was tough, but it was really, it was a really formative time. And I suppose after, I actually don't know exactly after how many months that we decided like, let's do this together. But uh, it just became clear it was the right thing to do because I brought a lot of book and theoretical knowledge that Robert didn't have. Mm. And he obviously brought a lot of the practical experience that I didn't have. So together we formed a really good alliance where I was kind of saying, well, did you think of this, 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 and this? All from what I'd already, I just read in things like E-Myth Revisited by Michael Gerber and books like that. Mm. And he was going, wow, that's a really good idea. And I, I was saying, well, look, it's not my idea, but this is this is stuff I've been learning. And so what was great was I got to, like I got a project I could take all this learning and apply it to. And I learned so much from that. And Robert did as well. So it just became apparent that that was the right thing to do to actually partner to go forward after going through this experience. And that's where I got my, I, was, I got a few breaks in that time, but that was a, the big break was I had knowledge and it was valuable knowledge, even though, I had very limited experience of actually executing on it, but there is a value in knowledge, you know? How, how did that balance of power kind of come about? Was it over time or something more set in yeah. stone when kind of building the partnership? You're going to do this. I'm going to yeah. do this. Or That's a great question. Know. That's a great, it's a really great question. I really actually, because for a number of years, Vinny, I 
I felt like I brought no value, you know, uh, you know, even though I did, because I was learning so much and I was actually doing a lot of the work. Like I was writing listings. I was, I was doing loads. Like, I mean, I was working, but at the same time, because I didn't have the experience Robert had, I often felt like he was kind of running the show, if you want to call it that. And I was kind of tagging along. He would say that wasn't true. I was, I was bringing a lot of ideas in. And as I look back, I realized, well, I actually did bring a lot of ideas in that would never have been brought in. So that's, that that's good. But at the time I didn't feel that way just because I was inexperienced and in my earlier twenties and trying to figure out my life, you know, and all the things we do right in our twenties, but the balance of power has always been kind of 50, 50 kind of always really like in terms of making decisions. And we even have rules. We have a rule called the no can't carry, which basically just means if I say yes and you say no, it can't just be a no. And then a lot of partnerships, that is the case. If someone says no, it's a no. And we're always like, well, why is that? Like, let's talk about it. If you're saying yes and I'm saying no, the person saying yes has to sell the yes better to the person that said no. And if there's still no uh, agreement or whatever, the person that said yes is now still saying yes. Okay, well, now we have a problem, but we've never had that. It's always been, if someone said no, they would either change over to a yes after really talking about it. Or the other person that said yes would change over to, you know, actually, you're right. I, I didn't think about it that way. That's true. Mm-hmm. So we've always had a very close, and people even nowadays, like after all the businesses we've ran and do run, people are always like, how, how do you guys do that? Because we're just, we just trust each other. And we know that each other has our best interests at heart. And I would say it's a very rare situation we have but i was coming through all of these tough times like i mean during that time as well when we were changing over to uh get rid of warehouses and all that robert had pretty big tax bills he had to pay and made made a lot of mistakes in the business from earlier in the business and and these were all catching up basically with him and uh and so we had to pay those off you know and he said to me i remember him saying look i know we're just starting to get her working but i've got to pay these things i can't just let these things fall he could have legally, but he didn't want to do that because he didn't feel right doing that. And so we learned a lot during that time together. That was a very formative time. With all the expansion that you've done over the years, of expanding from selling online to actually having warehouses, have they all been in the partnership and kind of a correlation to the core business? Or have any of them been ventures where you kind of ventured with other partners? Only in the last uh, year have we started to venture into really that territory. I've got one business now that I do that Robert's not involved in. It's just not something he's interested in, which is absolutely fine. Um, but but that's the only thing. Everything else that we do, even new businesses with new partners, we still are both involved in it in some capacity. Uh, just because we like working together, you know, and, and it usually works best when we're both involved in some way doesn't mean that it'll only work if that's the case, but but it's just, it's worked very well for a long time. And we, we like working together, but yeah, I have a new business now that I operate with two other partners. It's a financial advisory company and uh, Robert's not involved in that, but everything else we're, 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 uh, we're stuck together, you know? Do you, is there any, any differences of building a a new partnership now and knowing how the partnership has been in the past? So like laying the groundwork of these new partnerships, Hey, this is how we have to do it. I've learned from the past partnerships. This is what we should do. Anything like that come about when you're forming these? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to say something that's probably not going to work for a lot of people, but I'll just say it's worked for me. So I can only say that. And it's like the partnerships you get into where everybody's really worried about the legal side are the worst partnerships, you know, Mm. because it's almost like from day one, you're thinking about when I'm going to put the knife in your back, (laughs) you know what I mean? So that's not a good place. So I tend to really only want to work with people who are very trustworthy and trusting, Mm. um, which again is not perfect, but but that is the case. Uh, it just, it's, it's, it's been the way it's worked best for me, you know? Well, then I, I guess that brings the next question. I mean, how do you gain someone's trust or show that you're trustworthy to another individual? Yeah. Uh, time is one factor for sure. And I think just your track record speaks for itself as well. So my track record is very clean. Uh, there's, there's no, there's maybe one fallout 
with a partner we've ever had and that didn't come from our side it came from their side so i can look back and people can reference that track record and see yeah no like this this guy's is legit dude he's, he's a good guy but i think you just get a feel for people i get a feel very quickly for people and their motivations and i tend to test people as well a little bit now like put put in a situation where neither of us are making money for a long time mm. and then let's see what your attitude is like do you still have the long-term attitude that you said you had so little tests like that i usually put into place almost subconsciously that we do do that but usually it's just down to uh trust and and sometimes taking a chance and yeah like with certain partners we will have agreements in place that are but they're quite loose agreements but they're enough that it does protect both sides and one of the big things we tend to put in an agreement nowadays is just we can review both parties are going to review the situation in six months 12 months whatever it is every year every six months and it just gives you the out if you need the out but hmm. i've never had too many difficulties that way you know i've never i've always had pretty good luck with that stuff but i will say um robert is still like the person who i'm is like my main partner and hmm. not that i don't trust other partners because obviously if you're listening they'll be like why wow, you don't trust me no i, I do <laughs> It's a different, I, it's a, it's like if you go to war with somebody, right? You know, for the rest of your life, you have a very unique connection with that person. And yeah. I feel that way about Robert. Whereas with the new partners, it's earlier days, you know, we're getting to know each other, but every partnership we currently have so far has been great. Well, like you said, I mean, for the most part, time is going to be the, the biggest factor in most of these. And you've had a, a partnership with Robert for so many years that yeah. the time is there um we're talking about time and talking about the future i mean where do you see and i know you're doing coaching now and helping other people get to kind of building their own business where do you see yourself being in the next five years or your company being in the next five years yeah well we're doing a lot of stuff we're doing a, we have a number of businesses at this point but i mean with marketplace superheroes specifically we're venturing into deep, more areas of of amazon so we don't just talk about private label selling anymore we're doing your own branded products we talk about other things you can do on Amazon. So we recently launched a wholesale program, which we're really excited about and people are loving. We are going into other stuff on Amazon, like publishing and things like that to teach those different ways you can monetize the same platform. So that's definitely one thing we're doing. Uh, obviously, coaching has been a big part of our business now for the last number of years. So adding in more coaching programs in these various different areas will be another thing. Uh, continually building our services or our freight and our, and our software, like big investments gone to our software over the years to help people manage their products, research and manage the importing of items and stuff like that. So that's going to continue to develop over the years. And then, yeah, we'll, we'll keep, we'll probably move into some other e-commerce areas as well, you know, like print on demand and stuff like that, because there's a lot of different people out there. And what we want to be is we want to be in a situation where you can come in, and know whatever you're interested in. Uh, and then we can help you figure out something if you don't know what you want to do. But if you're interested in a particular area, we want to be there with not just an, a course, because courses are valuable, but it's changed to more of an implementation play now. You want to help people actually get the business up and operational. So I can see us being involved in a lot of the diff different areas with different experts and just building the best community that we can with the most trust and transparency that we possibly can that teaches people these e-commerce skills and how to apply them. And that's that's the main focus of that. And we have other businesses too that we're, we're helping like existing companies like Marketplace Superheroes. So course creators and, uh, you know, coaches and people like that. We have a whole system of Marketplace Superheroes we call Perpetual Launch. It's the process for how we basically um, are able to sell so many different products and services to our clients while still building massive trust and uh and, and we're we're the best in the world i think at, at the back end of our business and building that trust with our tribe so that's something we're looking to do with a completely unrelated separate business this year so there's lots going on like yourself i'm sure Vinny. lots happening and that's i like it that way i'll, I'll finish off with this question i mean if someone's looking to to get online and they haven't sold anything yet yet they're looking at it what's something they should be aware of thinking about uh, besides, of course, taking your course. Sure. Uh, look, it comes down to kind of capital and time, I would say, are the big 
factors and and skill base. I think there are three actually big important areas. So capital is one. Like I mean, if you're going to sell your own branded products, you're going to build your own brand and sell products within the brand. We call it a house brand because we sell all kinds of different products under the same brand. You you're going to have you need capital. You know, like I mean, to to launch a product, it's eight hundred to three thousand dollars ish, and you want to have multiple items. So you're going to be putting in uh, over time. Uh, money into that business so you need to be aware of that number one if you're doing private labels specifically but then if, if capital is an issue there's other ways to do it so you can do wholesale where you're selling already successful items they're already branded and you're simply ordering you know a box or a few boxes of each and you're sharing the sales with other people it's a very legitimate strategy it's a way to go if, if capital is an issue then time is another consideration right um so if you have no time whatsoever like well, you have to look at that number one, but then you have to think, well, if I've no time, if I've no capital, what's the best way of going about this? Do I have to change some of my time situation in order to be more successful? And then I suppose skill base is my final kind of brief point, which is just selling on Amazon specifically, be it private label, be it wholesale, be it whatever. It just makes things a lot easier because if you're selling on your own website, you've got to drive traffic to that website. You've got to in convert like, you know, convince people to buy from you rather than someone like Amazon. So there's a lot of factors that are going against you. Not that it's impossible. It's very possible. It's just a lot more difficult. So again, if your skill level is low, selling on Amazon makes it a lot easier because it just becomes about learning product research, which anybody can do. Then you're using the platform to grow your income. Uh, so they'd, they'd be the three things to be to consider. It's going to take money. It's going to take time. It's not going to happen overnight. But then again, when did anything? Well, thank you. Thank you, Stephen, for being here. If someone's listening right now and they're looking to stay in tune to all the different platforms you have, uh, into the classes and to, to anything else, what's the best way of them kind of getting more information? Yeah, I'd say two spots that I really recommend marketplace superheroes.com of course, just to go there. And there's a lot of free education around Amazon specifically. And then the other place would be our YouTube channel. Go to YouTube, type in marketplace superheroes and we're putting out videos all the time. We're actually going to put out some more videos pretty soon. Go up to two a week. We were doing two a week. We moved down to one a week last year. Um, things busy, right? Uh, but we're going to get back up to two again because people love the the videos. So yeah, I would check out the YouTube channel. There's hours and hours and hours of free education there that I'd encourage you to watch. Well, thank you, Stephen, for being here. I, I know there are so many great nuggets that you could take away uh, from this podcast. I know one of the big ones I took away from, if you have something, if you have a want, speak it into existence. And you're going to yeah. get that chance. You're going to get that up. But when you get that up, make sure you have the knowledge succeed in there. I mean, Stephen just didn't wait. He just said, please, please help, help, help. He was reading books, getting the knowledge, growing the knowledge. And when he got that chance, when he got that at bat, he was able to swing for the fences. Get uh, after it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank it. you, Stephen, uh, for again, for being here. Everyone, please subscribe, please share and go find Stephen. Bye, everyone. Thanks.